Welcome to uh, a wonderful session today, uh, to Journey to Hope, Recovery, and Beyond, um, that is uh, supported by the Pointer Fellowship at Yale, which is a, an entity that uh, is a wonderful group that can support bringing people to New Haven to stimulate uh, learning and dialogue and, and uh, uh, connect us to the broader uh, intellectual world that influences us. We're particularly honored today to have as our uh, pointer fellow, Johnny Benjamin. Um, and uh, Johnny's a mental health campaigner, advocate, author, and a vlogger. Um, and you know, I, 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 it's particularly inspiring when we have people who uh, uh, make uh, use of the diversity of the kind of experiences that people are exposed to and, and, and uh, have a positive impact as a result of their unique experiences. In Johnny's case, uh, he began having mental health problems uh, in childhood uh, and had uh, uh, auditory hallucinations, which many of you uh, know to be a common symptom of uh, some psychiatric disorders. He later developed depression and eventually was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, uh, a variant of, of schizophrenia in his early 20s. He was hospitalized in 2008. And at that time, he ran away or left the hospital. Ran away is a value judgment. Uh, in, in, but uh, left the hospital, but he was intending to take his own life. And in particular, he was thinking about jumping off a bridge. And, and someone passed by uh, uh, and found him while he was thinking about committing suicide uh, and, and, and convinced him not to take his own life. And this moment was uh, inspiring for him, and he may talk about this today, with the Find Mike campaign, which had an enormous impact. In 2011, he began vlogging uh, about his experiences uh, on YouTube um, and, and was able to make use of this evolving platform now, something people might uh, are used to uh, uh, using. It's part of everybody's daily life. But was able to use this to reach an enormous number of people uh, and, and to help people to understand um, mental illness and the opportunities also from treatment. In 2012, he published a book of poems called Pill After Pill, Poems from a Schizophrenic Mind. Uh, and, uh, and the poetry for that book actually was written in part while he was uh, hospitalized in 2008. By 2013, his vlogs had drawn thousands of views, uh, and he received the first annual Janie uh, Antonio Award uh, from a mental health charity called Rethink Mental Illness for his mental health advocacy. And then in 2014, he, he launched his uh, groundbreaking Find Mike campaign. Um, uh, and because uh, he didn't know the name of the person that, that uh, uh, contacted you and helped you to rethink, rethink your plan for suicide. Um, and uh, the, the rationale is, is so consistent with everything that he's done, which is that um, that hearing voices or having suicidal feelings or becoming depressed or whatever the, the emotional or cha other challenge that you're experiencing, these are in, in their own way common experiences that, that, that they shouldn't be marginalizing or disenfranchising experiences uh, that lead people to be isolated and not get the help that they need. And so, so it was such a clearly important process that so many people like Stephen Fry or Boy George or Pri uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron got involved in this incredible um, uh, uh, effort. In 2016, Johnny launched ThinkWell, uh, which helped to bring uh, mental health education into schools um, and, and help young people who are, are going through things that they don't understand to have some some sense that, 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 that they're not alone in their experiences. In 2016, he also received MBE, which is a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. You don't get like a sword and shield with that, do you? No. No, no. 
but it's very it's a really high honor and that's a really it's a wonderful way of recognizing his his important contributions and then in may of this year he published his memoir titled uh, stranger on the bridge and uh, which is uh, uh, i think will be some of what you're what you're drawn on today so johnny we're thrilled to have you here really appreciated the the uh, long travel that you had to go through to get here, and we're really looking forward to the to the session. So thank you. Thanks, John. So um, I'm going to just say a few more words uh, because Johnny and I know each other a little bit more personally. My name's Phil Corlett. Um I'm a, a faculty member here in in the psychiatry department, and I like to think a lot about how people think about themselves. And I think we all like to think about ourselves in in certain ways. We like to think that we're better friends and better partners than we are. We rate ourselves as better drivers on average than everybody else, and <laughs> that can't statistically be possible. I think what we're going to hear about today is a story of people who actually lived up to some of those expectations. We're going to hear about Neil and Johnny on that bridge. Neil making a decision to reach out to Johnny at a time when clearly he needed a lot of help. But it was. I don't think it was an easy decision. I don't think it's a decision that all of us would have taken, and I think that's one of the more inspiring things about this story. And then everything that happened next is just so incredible. Johnny sharing and communicating and reaching out to people about the things that he'd experienced, things that we like to keep personal, things that we don't think is, are, are a good idea to share. Feeling vulnerable, not having that sort of classic British stiff upper lip, which we're all somewhat stricken by at times. I defy you all not to be moved by this story and not to feel emotional today. I've heard it many times and it still moves me. Um, and I'm just really excited that we can bring them here today and have them share it with us. So please, Johnny, thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, working, great. What a great introduction. Uh, no expectation to live up to whatsoever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as you heard, um, yeah, just to you know, clarify who is who, uh, this is Johnny Benjamin, MBE, and I'm Neil Laybourne, full stop. And <laughs> we're, also, uh, we're also joined by Johnny Quinn Alston in the front. Raise your hand, Johnny. And uh, his brother, Wesley Alston, as well. So... Uh, that's us, um, and as you heard, you know, Johnny's had quite the, uh, the journey, and he, yeah, he's been all over the world, newspapers, magazines, books, and if you're wondering where else you might have seen him, uh, he's on Tinder quite a lot, so <laughs> that could be, uh, I don't know if you swipe left or right, I don't use it, but um, yeah. So essentially, what we'd like to do is um, put across what we hope is, is uh, an important and powerful message, um, and we'd like to do that just by using the power of narrative. And um, there, there's a few key messages that we would like to hit along the way. And uh, hopefully we'll explain those. What we really love, actually, is, is afterwards, if there's any open dialogue, comments, and particularly questions that you guys might like to ask while you have the opportunity and while we're in the room, not only ourselves, but we're such great experts. So we really, really would encourage those questions. And we're shameless. We will talk about anything. So please do ask. Um, conscious for time. Um, I think we're supposed to have a hard finish about one o'clock. So I am going to just swiftly hand over to Johnny. Let him uh, take it from here, because the story starts with Johnny. So thanks. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you sit down? Yeah, take a seat. <laughs> um, I'm standing in a good place, yeah? Lower the screen. Yeah, sure, sure. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for uh, taking, I know you're all very busy, so thank you for taking the time out to come and, to come and listen. Special thanks to Yale uh, for this opportunity. Um, and a, a special thanks to, to both Phil and, and to Cheryl as well, because they made this happen. If it wasn't for both of them, we, we wouldn't be here. So really, Incredibly grateful, incredibly grateful. So uh, we're going to talk about our, our personal story. And actually, we always start by saying, um, you know, if anything comes up for anyone at all during the, the talk, we, we talk quite frankly and quite, 
honestly about, uh, you know, me both mental health and suicide as well. And I know that can be very challenging. And if anything comes up for anyone at all, if it's too much, please don't feel you have to sit and, and endure it. If it's too much, please do take some time out, you know. Uh, exits are there. Um, yeah, please do take some time out. Don't, don't feel you have to sit and struggle. And we're here to talk afterwards. We'd love to talk to you afterwards as well. So please do come and talk to us. I'm going to take you back to the very beginning of, of the story. And actually, the story... Sorry. Before I do that, sorry. Before I do that, I'm going to just show you a, a, a quick clip. Just, uh, I'll show you the clip and I'll explain more afterwards. Looking for a man that changed my life. I just, I'm just so grateful to him for, for stopping and talking. It, it really was the moment that my recovery started. I expected maybe the one person to come forward and say this was me, but I actually had quite a number of people come forward. Is it just a case of just wanting to thank him? Just want to give him a hug. <laughs> the trends map are where the hashtag Find Mike is being used. Calls which is coming in all the time. This guy could be my Mike. That's, that's definitely not Mike. This guy is potentially the man that I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm petrified, to be honest. One of the most uplifting tales of our time, The Stranger on the Bridge, Monday at 9 on 4. So um, that's just a little preview of... Uh, the film that we both made. And we'll tell you more about that uh, later on in the story. But to take you back to the very beginning of where it all started, uh, it started here. So um, I was born on the 31st of January, uh, 1987, in a, in, a, in a place in North London. Anyone from North London, by any chance? Did, you, never, yeah? Okay, you've been. Well, that's the same thing. Um, yeah, I was born in North London, and I grew up, uh, grew up with mum, dad, older brother, and I had a very kind of typical childhood, I suppose. But for me, things started to change, really, around the age of three, four years old. So when I was this age, um, I started to see things that weren't there. Uh, I started to, to hear things that weren't there. I became a lot more um, anxious. Uh, I became quite violent as well. Um, and my parents didn't understand you know, what, what, what was going on. And they took me to the doctors a few times. And then eventually, I was referred on to a, a child psychologist uh, this is the letter to the psychologist. I don't, I don't really remember much of our sessions, to be honest. You know, I was really young at the time, so I can't really recall too much of, uh, of, of, of what happened. But me and my parents, we, uh, we didn't know how to talk about it. It was very, um, it, it was quite awkward. It was, it was kind of embarrassing. You know, I was seeing a psychologist at such a young age. So, yeah, it was a bit of a, bit of a, a, a tricky time. Meanwhile, I started um, elementary school. And I went through elementary school. I was always very... Uh, you know, academic, I was always very hardworking, but I always struggled um, outside of the classroom. I, I struggled to fit in and, and to make friends, and um, I just felt very different to everyone else growing up. And that continued through school and into my um, high school as well. This is me when I started high school. And I went to a really big uh, Jewish high school in, in North London, and um, yeah, the same thing happened there. I was very hardworking all the time, but outside of the classroom, just found it very difficult fitting in and making friends. And it was at this age that I started to hear a voice in my head. Um, I thought that everyone had a voice in their heads. I just assumed that, you know, if I was hearing a voice, then everyone must have a voice. It just made sense. I was hearing what I thought was the voice of an angel, and I link this a lot now. I link it a lot to uh, my, my Jewish upbringing. I was very influenced by my faith growing up. I went to Sunday school. I went to this Jewish secondary school and I was really absorbing a lot of what was being said to me and you know I started to hear the voice of this angel and I thought this was great I thought this meant I was a, a good Jew <laughs> um, I also link it now I, I lost my grandmother around this time as well and that was that was my first experience of grief and I think there's a link between that as well maybe but I thought everyone had this voice so I thought this was normal back then um, also around this time I went to the cinema and I saw um, has everyone seen the film The Truman Show with Jim Carrey so I saw the film The Truman Show, and um, I had a best friend at the time, and I went to the, the movies with my best friend, and we came out the, the, the theatre, and my best friend, he said to me, um, he said, you never know, but you could be in your own version of The Truman Show, he said. He said, I could be an actor. He said, this could all be a film set. And I began to really believe that, um, yeah, I was in this film set. I thought I knew where the cameras were that were watching me. Um, I believe that everything was kind of set up around me. And if I'm honest, I really liked this back then. Um, I, I felt kind of invisible at school. It was such a big school and I, yeah, I felt invisible. But I thought if I'm on this TV show, then people will like me and they'll see me and they'll respect me. 
you know? So I, I was quite happy with this at first. Things changed in my mid-teens. This is me with my brother around the age of sort of 15, 16. And, and when I was this age, um, I started to get these really low moods. And I didn't, I just, I didn't understand what was, what was happening. I just, I just felt incredibly low all the time. And I couldn't get out of these, these moods. And there was no reason for them. I just I didn't understand. I was very tearful. Um, the thing was, we didn't talk about mental health growing up. Um, when I was in school, the only thing that we got was, uh, they showed us the film, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and that was it. Um, that was kind of our mental health education. And uh, if you've seen that film, you know, it's not exactly the most inspiring <laughs> film about mental health, to be honest. Um, and that film scared me. It, 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 it put me off talking. Um, I just, I just didn't understand what was happening. I, I said to myself, you know, I come from a really loving home and I was doing really well in, in, in school, so why was I constantly feeling low? Um, it didn't, didn't make sense. Also, around this time, the voice in my head changed. So it went from being this nice voice, this angel, to what I thought was the devil. And I link this a lot now to... Um, I was struggling with my sexuality. Um, and coming from a Jewish family and Jewish, Jewish background, you know, I was told... Uh, being gay is a sin, and, and I, I started to feel in, increasingly uh, guilty and ashamed, and uh, I think there's a link between that and this change in voice, and this voice made life very difficult, um, started telling me to do things. I would always have to do things in threes. I would have to say certain things three times, or, or touch things three times, pick, pick things up and put them down three times, move three spaces. It was always things in threes that I'd have to do, um, but I... I felt like I had to do them because the voice would say, if you don't do this, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to punish someone that you love. So, yeah, it made life, made life, made life difficult. Um, I went, when I was 17, I went in secret to my doctor. Um, I didn't want my parents to, to find out. So I went in secret to my doctor. And my doctor was really good. I, I, I told him some of what was going on, and he was, he was good. He, he referred me on to what's called um, uh, CAMS in the UK. CAMS is the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, so the mental health service in the UK for young people. Um, and I went for, for one appointment, um, again, in secret. By this time, I really wasn't in a, in a good place. And um, yeah, it says here, I, I tried to um, hang myself in the school toilet. So suicide had come to the forefront of my mind because it was too difficult living with uh, the low moods and, and the voice and having to do these things and having to cover it up was, uh, yeah, it was very hard. Um, unfortunately, there was a long waiting list uh, for, for, for therapy after I had my assessment. I waited and I waited and um, I gave up waiting and I, I just said to myself, um, you know, I've, I've just got to just get on with it, just try and get on with it. I came up with a, a plan. My plan was I was going to um, go to university. I was going to go to university and I thought that would like solve everything. You know, I was going to have a fresh start. It was going to be a new me and I was going to leave everything behind in, in London. And I went to university. I went to Manchester. Um, which is north of England. Um, I went to Manchester, I went to university, and obviously everything came with me, of course, to, to university. But I thought everyone was having the time of their lives. I thought everyone was happy, you know, all the time at university. And I thought, again, I was the only one that was kind of struggling with these things. So again, I, I kept it to myself. But at university, things really began to spiral out of control. Uh, began to self-harm and um, misuse alcohol and just gradually isolate myself away from everyone. I mean, now I, I felt I was crazy. I, I, I told myself I was, I was crazy and, and, and insane, and I didn't want people to, to, to see or to know that, so I tried to isolate myself away from everyone. But everything did come out in my, in my final year of university. So this is me in um, November 2007. So, th yeah, I was in my, in my third year, in the first semester of my third year, my last year. And um, at this point, I became psychotic. So um, I lost control over what I was uh, saying and, and, and doing. I, I ended up on the streets of, of Manchester, um, uh, screaming and shouting. I, I felt like I was being possessed. Um, I kind of felt like the devil was inside of me. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I was, things were coming out of my mouth. That, it wasn't me, it wasn't my language, it was a horrible experience. I was taken to hospital, um, and then eventually I ended up in a, in a psychiatric hospital near my parents in London. Um, and when I, was, when I was admitted there, 
I was given my diagnosis, which, as you heard, is, is schizoaffective disorder. Um, and that, for me, was a massive, massive shock. I knew something wasn't, wasn't quite right, but um, when the psychiatrist said, uh, uh, <clears throat> when the psychiatrist said schizophrenia, um, for me, sorry, <laughs> for me that was kind of the end. It felt like my world just ended when I got my diagnosis. Um, uh, and for my parents as well, they, that, everything came out for, for everyone when I was admitted and, and, and di diagnosed. Um, uh, but I felt that was the end. By the way, the story does get better, just to say. <laughs> give, me, give me three minutes and the story will change. Uh, but the reality was, uh, it was very hopeless in the hospital where I was. No one around me was getting any better. I started getting worse. I started getting these panic attacks for the first time. And... Uh, a month into my stay, I remember uh, one night, uh, something in me just snapped. It literally snapped in my head. Uh, and I, I just, I saw the only way out for me was, was suicide. Um, I, there was no other way, really, for me. I, back then, I believed that suicide was the best thing, not just for me, but for my parents as well. I, was, I felt like I was going to be a burden on, on them for the rest of their lives. So I thought, you know... Best just to end it for everyone. It was the only way out, and I made a plan for the next day uh, to leave the hospital to, to run away, um, and I did. Uh, I said I needed a cigarette, and they let me out of the hospital, and I ran as fast as I could. And I ended up on this bridge, and um, I went onto the edge of this bridge, and um, I, don't, I don't think I was on there for very long, and then this stranger... Um, approached me and uh, stood stood next to me and began talking. And I'm gonna hand over to obviously no longer a stranger, of course, to uh, to carry on the story. Oh yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so um, I come into this story uh, nearly 11 years ago now. Um, so there's no cute baby pictures actually. Um, <laughs> Just me in a tank top is my opening gambit. Um, maybe we all needed that at this point anyway. Um, and Okay, so I'm 24 years old. Uh, I just decided I wanted to be a personal trainer. I also lived in a town uh, near North London called Watford. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Watford. Um, and so when I got this personal training diploma, I decided to move to London, uh, away from my family home for the first time. And, and I moved to London and I was renting a room with new flatmates. I was dating my new girlfriend, Sarah, at the time had this new job ahead of me working at Virgin Active Health Clubs, which is like Richard Branson's chain of health clubs in the UK. And yeah, everything was pretty rosy for me. So I started that job in November 2007. I uh, had a month at work and went back to, uh, back to Watford from London for Christmas. And when I came back to work in 2008, my first day back to work was the 14th of January. Uh, it was a Monday morning. Uh, and it was the same day, as you'd heard from Johnny, that he'd run away from the hospital. So I was making my way from my flat in southwest London into central London. Um, and I, I left my house really early that morning. And the first thing, it was, it was absolutely freezing cold. I was making my way to Waterloo Terminal, train station on the south side of Waterloo Bridge. And <clears throat> when I got to Waterloo Terminal that morning, uh, yeah, it was freezing cold. It was grey skies. It was raining. And everybody coming out into the rush hour was dressed for that, including me. We all had big winter coats, gloves, scarf, hat, and just marching over the bridge trying to get to work as quick as possible. Um, but in the distance, there was somebody who stuck out like a sore thumb. So unlike everybody else on the bridge, uh, dressed up for winter, you know, well, firstly, there was this guy who was sitting on, on the railings, just on his own. And, and uh, the second thing was he was just wearing a jeans and a T-shirt that cold morning, just shivering, looking out over the River Thames, just in his own world. And, um, yeah, seeing that, you know, obviously alarm bells start ringing and uh, any bridge in a big city, it's very busy. Uh, there's so much going on, the, the buses, the cars, the pedestrians, cyclists, taxis. And, and I genuinely thought, you know, um, before I get there, somebody may, well, talk to this guy. And if they do, maybe I could lend a hand. Maybe I wouldn't need to. I could keep walking. And as I'm assessing this and it's going on in my head, uh, I'm now the next person that's walking past Johnny on the same side of the bridge and... I don't know, maybe 
him being a younger guy, similar age, slightly better looking. <laughs> Subjective. I thought, you know, maybe there's something I could do to help, you know. So I just started gravitating towards him. And I didn't know what I was going to say at all. So my chat-up line wasn't great. I said, hi, mate, why are you sitting on a bridge? <laughs> <laughs> say what you see. So, uh, But that started our conversation. Uh, first conversation we had, and um, essentially he answered my question, and he said, I don't want to be here anymore, I want to take my life. He was actually um, really shocked somebody was standing next to him. I completely pierced his, his bubble that he was in, completely pierced his world. And, uh, but he answered my question, and I asked why, and he started to tell me, about uh, not, not the voices, delusions, but you know the pain, needing to find peace, and you guys probably get. So yeah, I had no idea, no idea how to navigate that conversation. Um, so simply asking questions was the first instinct, just letting him open up. But I had my phone on me, I wanted to try and get some help, and I asked Johnny if we could call somebody that he knew, maybe a family member, or, but he was adamant that wasn't an option. Um, his family didn't know he was there, and that's how he wanted it to be, and th that he'd made his mind up. And, and actually, he didn't want me there. You know, He was like, look, mate, I can see what you're trying to do. Thank you. Just leave me alone. And he was quite rude. But you know, we <laughs> pushed on. But, um, <laughs> and you know, what happened over the next sort of 20, 25 minutes or so was essentially we just connected. There was a natural chemistry. Um, he allowed himself to open up and talk. But... Like I said, after nearly half an hour, he was adamant, that's my decision today. I was fresh out of ideas what to do. Uh, there's a coffee shop at the end of the bridge on Waterloo, on Waterloo Bridge, and, and I said to Johnny, do you want to go for a coffee? Do you want to sit down and, and um, don't worry about tomorrow, just look at today? Um, I really needed it as well, coffee. So he, uh, Something resonated, and that actually changed the whole conversation. He said, okay. He stepped down from the side of the bridge and we were side by side on the, on the sidewalk and we were about to go for that coffee. Um, we didn't get the chance. Somebody had called the police. Don't know who to this day, but <clears throat> the police turned up. The way it happened was a bit not great, but a police car came just screeching up beside us, doors opened, and they knew why they were there. The, the police officers came out and just made a beeline for Johnny, and he panicked. He ran back for the side of the bridge, and when the police um, got involved straight away, they thought the best thing to do would be to handcuff Johnny, um, head down back of the police car, close the door, and actually, uh, Johnny was there in the back of the car by himself while I gave my statement to the two police officers. Um, but at the time, nearly 11 years ago, I thought, well, you guys are the professionals. You know, maybe you've been trained for this situation, and I guess that's how you handle that situation. So I didn't think too much of it, but yeah, it didn't seem quite right. But anyway, when all that was over, I gave my statement to the police, and um, they said, "Thank you, mate. Please go back to work." So, so I did. And the police car drove away, and I thought, you know, best of luck, mate. I hope you're okay, and um, I'll notch that up to experience and get on with my day and make sense of that later on, which I did. I had absolutely no idea, however, that by complete surprise, six years later, that I was going to get to meet Johnny again, but under better circumstances. I'm going to pass back over. So just to talk uh, very briefly about, about what happened that day, um, I think for me, um, just having someone there to, to, to really listen. Um, in the hospital where I was, you know, I, I said a few times that I felt suicidal. And they would say to me, right, well, we need to up your meds now. And, and you need to go back to the suicide ward. And the suicide ward is, uh, you know, someone that just sits and watches you 24-7. They don't talk. They just sit and they watch. And there was just never an opportunity for, um, you know, someone to really listen. And, and Neil listened with this amazing kind of, um, this, this, this patience and this, calmness and this uh, empathy and, and, and non-judgment and uh, yeah it was very powerful you know there were two key things he said to me really the first key thing he said to me was um, don't be embarrassed you know you don't have to feel embarrassed and I'd never heard someone say that before um, because I was that was the main um, that was the main reason that I'd done this it was I can't even put into words um, the embarrassment and the shame uh, around everything in my head my diagnosis, my sexuality as well. Um, just for someone to say it's fine, don't, don't feel embarrassed. Uh, 
It was like a massive weight off my shoulders. And I began to talk. I felt, um, I felt safe with this guy. I thought I could talk to him, no judgment. The second key thing he said to me, and to be honest, I think the thing that really made all the difference, he just said to me very kind of uh, casually, he said, uh, you'll be all right, you'll get better. And no one had said that to me before. Um, in the hospital where, where I was, they were saying to me and my parents, you know, we don't know. We, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. But this guy had this kind of conviction, this conviction that I would get better. And um, just hearing that, this, 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 this conviction and this positivity, um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to have this coffee. I wanted to carry on this conversation. Um, and I, I stepped off the edge onto the sidewalk. And as you heard, the, the, the cops came along and um, I was taken away. I was sectioned. I was given a uh, section two, which means that you have to stay in hospital for a certain period of time. Once that was done, I was then taken back to the hospital that I ran away from. Um, and I remember on the way back to the hospital, you know, there was still the kind of the same stuff going on in my head. But I felt um, different. I had a little bit of hope. I think that's what it was. I had a little bit of hope from talking to this guy and him saying, you, 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 you can get better. You, you, you know, I had this bit of hope that I hadn't had before. And this hope carried me through the next few weeks and months. And eventually I was discharged. When I was discharged, I was a different person. Um, my psychiatrist uh, said, said to me and my parents, he said, uh, he said, you know, you're a shadow of the person that you were before. I don't know if that was helpful, but, um, <laughs> but it was true. Um, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't have mental health issues. All my friends, they were graduating from university and, 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 and they were moving forwards and I just, I just felt incredibly stuck. And I did go back to university, actually. I did go back and I, f I finished my degree, but it was, it was hard. But when I finished my degree, I was just completely lost. I stopped taking all my medication uh, all in one go. Just, yeah, I just had, I, again, something in me snapped and I was just like, I can't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be this person anymore. I stopped taking all my medication and I became unwell again. Uh, this time I believed I was the Messiah. I, I, I had all these visions. I was gonna, I was gonna save the world. Um, and I spent my time writing letter after letter to all these important people. This one is to uh, Sir Paul McCartney. Didn't hear back, obviously. Uh, after that, I, I went through a phase I, I believed. I was like a reincarnation of the singer, um, uh, Nina Simone. Um, I believed I was a uh, yeah, reincarnation. And um, uh, I was going to be the next uh, uh, Nina Simone. I can't sing. But I... Um, I made all these record demos and I sent them off to record labels and, uh, you know, I didn't hear back from any of them either. Uh, all of my early 20s, really, were just spent, um, stuck in my head. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I couldn't talk about it. No one could get through to me. It was, it was tough. But something changed in my mid-20s. In my mid-20s, um, a family friend of ours had a heart attack, a really major heart attack, and um, I went to see him afterwards. And when we sat down and we talked for ages, he talked to me about everything that he'd gone through, uh, from the first pain in his arm while he was driving, you know, to the, he had a heart, a heart bypass and, and, and what that felt like and what it felt like for him living with this, this heart condition. And I remember I sat there and I watched him and I, I listened to him and I just said to myself, why can you talk so openly and, and so frankly about your, your health, your physical health, your heart? Why can't I talk about my mental health, you know? Um, and I went home that night and I, I, I wanted to talk like he'd talked to me, but I, I could never look someone in the eyes and talk. Um, I know I keep using this word, but the embarrassment, I just, I just, couldn't, I just couldn't break through the embarrassment. So I went home that night and I got my camera phone out on my phone I made a video um, it was easier talking to the camera and I put this video on YouTube actually um, I just wanted to uh, just connect to someone um, and I thought YouTube was, w w would be a way to do that uh, back then I did it under a different name I, 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 I had a pseudonym I didn't want my parents to see it but um, I put it out there and the response was amazing people started messaging me uh, from, from all over the world, and actually that's our connection to these two amazing people at the front, which you'll hear more about uh, later. But it was amazing getting all these messages back from people, people saying to me, you know, I hear a voice, or I've had the Truman delusion, you know, this Truman Show delusion. I, you know, when I, when I realized that I wasn't alone in that, it was such a relief. And this helped me to talk, I started to make more videos, uh, it was helping me, it was helping other people, and 
I, I think this built up my confidence to talk, making these videos. And eventually I started to talk to um, my family. And, uh, you know, I finally uh, was able to uh, say, you know, um, I've got mental health issues and I'm gay. And, and that for me was the biggest weight off my shoulders. It really was the turning point because, you know, I didn't have to hide anything anymore. I could just be myself. And yeah, I felt, I, I suddenly felt more human again. Um, and uh, it was at that point that I, I said to myself, you know, I wanna, I wanna try and help people. And I, I got involved with this charity, as you heard, um, this charity in the UK called Rethink Mental Illness, who, who are specifically focused on schizophrenia. And I, I sat down with them one day and, and uh, I told them my story. And uh, they said to me, they said, you know that guy on the bridge that stopped you and helped you? Have you ever thought of trying to find him and, and to thank him? And, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I, di I didn't know where he was. He could be anywhere. How, how would we find him? And they said, why don't we launch a social media campaign to find him? And we did. We did. Um, six years to the day that we first met on the bridge, uh, we launched this social media campaign to find the guy on, on, on national TV in the UK. Um, to be honest, if I'm completely honest, I, I didn't think that we'd find him. Um, but we did it. We did the campaign to, to raise awareness of, of, of mental health, but also suicide as well. Suicide is a really difficult, difficult subject, but we have to talk about it. You know, it's in the UK, it's the biggest killer of, of, of men under 45. In the UK now, it's the biggest killer of, of both men and women under 35. And we need to we need to talk about it. So we wanted to get people people talking and, and, and uh, we, we launched this campaign. I couldn't, I wasn't 100% sure of his name. I thought his name was Mike. His name's Neil. <laughs> uh, so I called the campaign Find Mike, which wasn't a good start. But um, <laughs> the, re the response was amazing. It, it, it went viral, it started trending. It was very surreal. At one point, the hashtag Find Mike was bigger than Beyonce bigger than Obama, very strange. But the most extraordinary thing happened. We actually had 38 people come forward saying, I think it was me that helped you on the bridge. <laughs> Literally, one after the other, these people came forwards and it was me, it was my dad, it was my brother. And uh, the most just extraordinary thing is that all these people were genuine. They had stopped someone on a bridge in London around that time. Um, all these, we call them these silent heroes, you know, people like Neil that just on their way somewhere and they're talking to someone off, off the edge of a bridge and just going on their way. And honestly, just, just astonishing stories. But none of them were the person that we were looking for. Um, they all had different accounts. And, and one week went into two weeks and we thought we're not going to find them. And then... <laughs> so um, I'm standing here, so a bit of a spoiler to the story. But uh, you heard anyway. But focus on the journey as well as the destination. So um, I'm going to be uh, quite brief, actually, um, just to make sure we can get everything out in time. Um, so once the police car drove away and, and I had that short walk to work in 2008, and <clears throat> when I got to work, my head was a muddle. You know, just uh, trying to remember that conversation. But it was my first day back. I'd only been there a month. I didn't know anybody particularly well. So I didn't want to tell them the, the real reason I was late. I thought if I tried to explain the experience that I just had talking to Johnny that maybe they would just dismiss it or change the subject or maybe not even believe me. So I didn't mention it to anybody at work that day or really going forward. Um, but when I got home that night, I, I called my girlfriend, Sarah, as you heard, and you know told her about the conversation. Over the next few weeks and months when I saw close friends or family for dinner, you know, I told them, about this, this conversation. And, you know, for me, that felt good enough just to kind of put it to bed in my head. And, and um, yeah, I felt fairly positive, actually, about the interaction. Um, however, that was now my uh, daily commute to work for years to come. I would come into Waterloo Terminal. I'd go over Waterloo Bridge into the centre of London. And, you know, I would always think, you know, especially certain times of year, you know, what happened to that guy? You know, did he ever go back, I wonder? Did he ever take his life? Did his family find out? Yeah, so, I mean, that conversation always, always stuck with me, uh, and it was firmly etched in my mind. If you fast forward then six years later, and, uh, you know, the Find Mike campaign is all over breakfast TV and radio and newspapers, and uh, apparently I'm bigger than Beyonce, uh, but I have no idea because I've missed absolutely everything, so 
Um, so it's now 2014. I'm running my own business, um, boot camps, retreats, um, personal training, one to one, and and um, yeah, I'm, I'm working early mornings, late nights. Don't know if anybody knows about that, but I'm not not really watching the news and missed this whole campaign. The one person who reconnected us, actually, uh, another bizarre twist of fate was Sarah, who at this point is now my fiance. She stuck with me, good girl. And uh, that's, that's us a few years ago. And um, one night, Sarah's on the train home from work. It's about 10 o'clock a weeknight. I'm about to go to bed. Sarah's on the train home from London, and she calls me up, and she's almost frantic on the phone. And um, she's like, darling, you need to sit down. I've got something I need to tell you. I said, I'm lying down. Okay. And she said, well, it's about a guy called Mike. And I'm thinking, don't do this to me on the phone because, you know, we're getting, uh, we're engaged, I love you. And, and uh, she said, no, no, no. Um, but when she got it out, she said, do you remember the guy that you spoke to six years ago on Waterloo Bridge? And when I heard that, it took me a minute and I said, yeah. And she said, well, I think he's looking for you. And I said, what are you talking about? She called me after she'd read this post on Facebook. This is the exact post, actually, that had been shared by Rethink and Johnny friend of a friend of a friend, and ended up on Sarah's Facebook feed. So I waited for her to get home, actually, before I looked at it. I was on the phone with her. She ran home from the train station. She got to the front door, and, and I took her phone off her, and I looked at this post, but I, I didn't need to click the link and read the story like she did because, um, you know, his face was on there, and, and everything came back to me as if it was yesterday. You know, the whole conversation on the bridge, you know, his voice, everything. I did remember his name, so just saying. Uh, I'm over. It's fine. And, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was when I saw it. And um, I saw everything unfold on TV. But then that night, I found some of his YouTube videos when I followed the links, the ones he made to help people. And that's when it really dawned on me. And I watched some of his videos with Sarah. You know, wow, he never went back. He never took his life. Um, he seems really happy. He's helping other people. And, and I think there's a, a definite message there about random acts of kindness. And, and I'm sure many people in this room have, have done a random act of kindness or had one done unto them. Not that mine that day was any bigger or lesser than anybody else's, but that evening, I actually got to find out how my random act of kindness turned out. And, and I think if we all knew the consequence of those, then we would probably all feel empowered to, to be more aware. But, so anyway, um, I got in touch with Rethink Mental Illness and came forward. I said, my name's Mike, but I'm Neil. It's very confusing for everybody. <laughs> Essentially, a week after that email, uh, me and Johnny were reunited, and um, Rethink were filming the whole search as part of this awareness campaign for suicide. So we're going to play you guys uh, the clip of when we met for the first, well, for the second time, but for the first time, if you know what I mean. When, when he walked through the door, I was just a bag of nerves. I've never been so scared in my whole life. Hiya. Yeah. Okay. How's it going? Yeah. I'm alright. Yeah? I'm alright. You? Yes. I didn't instantly recognise him, but there was something there. There was something that was familiar about him as he approached me. I saw you on the TV. Yeah, I saw you speaking on the TV. Don't be nervous, honestly. And then it was when we sat down and began talking. There was a moment when everything just came back to me. And I could see him there on that bridge and and there he was now in front of me, and it was just overwhelming. It's just unbelievable, because, oh my gosh, like, you know... Are you with you him? Yeah, now I've seen you, like, it's all coming back. Really? Like, you standing inside of me, and, um... He definitely said, it's all coming back now, and I can remember your mannerisms, and I can remember your voice, and, you know, I can see you. You can tell, like, he, he just, he understands, and he doesn't judge, and just sits there with his kind of this big smile and uh, I think everyone could do with a friend like Neil. It, it's, it's, it's hard to put to words actually what that was like. It was, uh, yeah, it was, oh, when, sorry. <laughs> it was, uh, it was just, it, very special, very special to be able to, you know, thank him. And we talked and we talked and we just forgot the cameras were there. It was, uh, yeah, it was very, very special. And after that, um, once obviously I, uh, <laughs> Got his, got his name right. Um, Neil, Neil said to me, you know, what can we do? How can we work together? How can we help people? And we've been working together ever since, and it's, it's been a remarkable, remarkable journey. The best thing about what we do is, uh, 
is getting messages such as this, which says, um, thanks for the various steps you've taken over the past few weeks to highlight mental health issues. Watching your story unfold stopped me from taking my own life. So a big thank you, mate. We need, we need more, more stories of hope and, and recovery. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what it's like in the, in the US, but in the UK for a long time, there's been so many negative stories you know, when it comes to mental health, and we need to change that. Um, after that, our, our documentary, The Stranger on the Bridge, came out on, on, on Channel 4, and that was really well received in the UK and, 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 and led to lots of doors opening up for us. And we've got another just quick video just to show you some of the highlights of, of, of the last few years of working together. Uh, I'm Neil Laybourne. I'm Johnny Benjamin. We've got a really busy day ahead of us. Just arrived in Belfast. We're now at Schroeder's. Today we fly out to St John's in Canada. We're finishing up in uh, Facebook. Uh, me, Johnny and Michelangelo. I overcame that adversity and if I can overcome any adversity then, then you can as well. You really need to support each other uh, and don't be afraid to ask if, if, if you need support as well. So, we're in the last mile of the London Marathon. Uh, well, I'm very honoured, mate, to give you this. I'm very grateful, uh, well, because I'm a person who could very easily have been sat on that bridge. That was Neil's highlight, was that kiss from uh, <laughs> Russell Brand. Um, True. It's, there you go. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. I think for me, my highlight was running the London Marathon last, last year. We ran the London Marathon together. And at one point, towards the end of the marathon, we actually ran underneath the bridge where we first met. And that was really kind of wow. You know, we had that conversation up there, and now we're running the marathon together. It was, um, again, it was very, very special. For me, it was even more special. Um, I'd just come out of hospital at the time. I had um, a relapse last February and went back into hospital. And... I've had a few relap relapses over the last few years, and you know, and I know I, I have to manage my, my mental health, and I, I do that in different ways. I, I take medication now, and, and I know medication maybe isn't for everyone, but for me, I think it keeps me relatively stable and balanced. Uh, I, I have therapy now, and at the moment, I'm having something called a CFT, which is uh, compassion focused therapy, and that's been really, uh, yeah, really interesting, really interesting and helpful for me. Um, the other thing that's really helped me massively is mindfulness massively helped me. I mean, um, it doesn't switch everything off, but it stops things from being so intense and overwhelming through things like meditation or yoga. It's, it's been a massive help. But I think more than anything, it's talking. It's talking and it's, it's being honest and open and, um, and having support. I'm very lucky to have the support that I have. Um, yeah. Um, but the thing that keeps me going, I think, the most is, is, is the work that we do. And uh, my particular passion is young people. Um, we know that three quarters of all Mental health issues begin in adolescence, so it doesn't make sense why we don't do more in schools. So two years ago, we launched this uh, workshop, as you heard, uh, which is called Think Well, and Think Well is run by Pixel Learning, and it goes around schools all over the, the UK, um, but it's not enough. Um, we're trying to get mental health embedded into the curriculum. You know, why don't we talk about mental health within different subjects? So in history, for example, there's so many people in history that had mental health challenges like Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln or, or Florence, Florence Nightingale. Why can't we talk about that within school or in science? You know, why do we never learn about the brain or in, um, in uh, English? You know, we, I remember we studied uh, Romeo and Juliet. And at the end of Romeo and Juliet, they both killed themselves, unfortunately. But I remember my teacher just pretended it didn't happen. And, you know, she said, right, your essay. And we were just sitting there. We were just all gobsmacked. You know, they've just 
taken their lives and we're not going to talk about that. So we want to get mental health embedded into the curriculum and we think it can make a massive difference. And we're doing work both in the UK but also, also abroad. Uh, this was a, a trip to India uh, a couple of years ago to work with uh, all these young people, um, hundreds of these, these, these young people living in an orphanage near Mumbai. And um, unfortunately, they, they all have HIV. Uh, but because they've got HIV, you know, their physical health was being, was being treated, it was being monitored, it was being addressed. A lot of these young people have had a lot of trauma, um, but no one wanted to talk about their trauma or, 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 or look at their mental health. So we were working with the young people and with the adults as well on looking at preventative tools. You know, we, we just don't focus enough on, on prevention. You know, we focus on mental health at the crisis end, you know, when things go wrong. But if we can take it all the way back to the, the prevention stage, it can make such a massive difference. So that's one of uh, the huge areas that, that we're working on. <clears throat> I'd just like to um, segue into uh, the colleagues that we're here with today. So since meeting Johnny uh, in 2014 for the second time, that's when, I guess, <clears throat> my um, perception of mental health or my thinking about mental health had a paradigm shift. You know, beginning to work with uh, Rethink, becoming an ambassador, and the role of an ally, somebody who's there to listen, but also to um, hear from people who had lived experience of mental health. So I started this journey, understanding, learning more, and, and we did a lot of awareness in, in hospitals and schools and, and in the NHS, in National Health Service in, in the UK. <clears throat> After the documentary came out, that's when organisations, uh, private sector, really started getting in touch with us and saying, you know, can you, can you come in and start to do some work because there's a big crisis in, in the workforce. And, and so we, again, just more experience and more learning and that essentially um, got me thinking about, well, that's just the UK, but what about other places around the world? You know, these, these organisations... For example, I'm sure Yale, I don't know the intricacies, but I'm sure you guys have a big international reach. And, and how can we help those organisations just to make a linked-up approach with their networks and, and, and get this message out there? And we couldn't do it alone, so um, we'd, uh, we'd flown out to Texas in 2014 to uh, go on a, uh, a Glenn Beck show. We didn't know who Glenn Beck was. Apparently, he's a big deal here. Um, we said, yeah. Trip to Texas, great. Uh, that's where we met uh, Johnny Quinn. And um, I'm going to let Johnny just tell you guys uh, a little bit about our, our sort of US work. Um, before I do that, just to leave you guys on a very, uh, the message of hope and recovery and the power of conversation when it comes to, to mental health. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass over to Johnny and hopefully we're going to have uh, five minutes uh, for questions before one o'clock. So, so thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, really briefly, actually I'll start uh, our little bit of the story by saying in 2011, uh, my family went through a really interesting uh, journey. I came out to my parents, and then a month later, I'm going to give him like 10 seconds to stand up and just, this is Wesley. Hi, my name is uh, Wesley, and like Johnny Quinn said, in 2000, well, in 2011, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Uh, and from there, we were kind of, long story short, we met Johnny and Neil, um, and we connected, you know, things just kind of fell in place, and thus, we're here today, and we've been working together ever since, so. That's what Thank you. And so that was a month after I came out, so I was, like, really happy about this, you know, new thing about myself, and then the other foot dropped, and it was like, oh, no, how do we deal with this? We didn't know anything about it. Um, it was very surreal for us. And I, as Johnny mentioned, uh, came across Johnny Benjamin's YouTube page. And it was really um, inspiring for me because I was in a place and my family was in a place where we didn't know if we were going to get our, my brother back. We thought, okay, we might physically still have him, but where is he? You know, do we get him back? Uh, and I saw this young man. He was so charismatic, so creative in front of the camera. And it showed me that people can have one of the most mysterious diagnoses, and still go on to be, uh, you know, very active in life and very present. So, uh, as Neil mentioned, we all met, uh, well, first of all, I introduced Johnny to Wesley. I went on YouTube, made a comment on the video, didn't expect to hear back, but I asked, would you please help my brother uh, through his recovery? Do you have tips, et cetera? He not only helped, they sort of became pen pals, um, I got a chance to meet Johnny in London, and we sort of started this back and forth communication. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, we get a call from a producer uh, in Texas, and they wanted to fly us out 
and surprised Johnny Benjamin, who was being interviewed on Glenn Beck's uh, TV show, The Blaze, is what it was called, I think. So we all four met there, and you know it was really fun. We actually went out one night and got really drunk. Uh, I think I remember slapping Neil in the face, which usually doesn't happen the first time I meet someone, and he slapped me back. <laughs> but that's that's just how good of a night it was. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, and so we really bonded. And uh, and fast forward to 2017. Is this still on? Okay. Um, we had always talked about maybe doing something together. I had a tech startup uh, throughout most of my 20s, and there was a lot of creative energy. So they asked if I could help them bring their awareness work to the US, and I was like, that's a great opportunity. I would love to do that. And as well, because of things that I saw that weren't there for my brother uh, when he was going through his recovery, friends that ran away, um, dreams, career dreams that were put on hold, I was like, I'd really like us to also start thinking about you know, ways we can use your guys' story, um, our reach to get creative in terms of social development, not just in terms of medical recovery, but helping people feel entitled, uh, just like everyone else does, to participate in life, whether it's career, whether it's dating, whether it's friendship, what have you. So um, we created an initiative called You Are Right Mate. The name comes from the British expression, you're right, you know, like, <laughs> which is this the one thing I remember after I go to London. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the idea there was that, you know, not to just think of that as a rhetorical question, but also, like, genuinely being able to turn to people, uh, see how they're doing. And this initiative is not just about helping the people who are suffering, but also the people around them develop the tools, the patience, uh, the language to to you know, uh, be there for them. Um, so this is a combination of awareness like we're doing today, but also we're starting to venture into organizational support. Um, we've done a lot of, you know, uh, we've, we've had a big presence in the corporate sphere, building off of relationships they've had. Um, we're also excited about you know, relationships with universities. Um, and we really want to be bold uh, and say that we're going to develop things that maybe do not exist yet. Uh, that help people beyond the initial recovery um, to actually, you know, feel entitled to play whatever role in life that they want to, regardless of what's going on in their head. So that's you all right, mate, in a nutshell. Um, and I'm going, I'm not sure who the mic goes to next, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think actually we would um, just welcome any any questions uh, while we have time? And um, we just, again, just like to say thank you to Yale University. Um, thank you to Philip and Cheryl, who have been amazing hosts and very hospitable. And, um, and please just remember the, the message of hope and recovery and beyond when you're thinking about mental health, not only with yourself, but those people around you and, and who you might be able to, to affect. So, so thank you. And please, somebody ask at least one question. It would make us feel very at home. Thank you. So I know we are a little tight for time, but let's have some questions, yeah? Okay, so Johnny, um, you've, uh, you just took yourself off meds. How did you recover? Um, do you know what, actually? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on medication now, but yeah, I took my, myself off meds and it was a mess for quite a while. And then actually, um, so when I was in hospital uh, the first time, a nurse, uh, she pulled me aside and she, she said to me, she said, um, have, you ever, have you ever tried any mindfulness? And I said, I said no. And she said, she said get, this, get this thing, it's called um, Mindfulness for Beginners by someone called um, uh, John Kabat-Zinn. And it was an audio book. And I got, I got the audio book and to be honest, it sat on my shelf for, for a few years because I, I was just like, I can't, I can't meditate, I can't do mindfulness, I can't. But then after, yeah, a while after I stopped taking my meds, I was like, I need, I, I, need to, I need to do something. And I just, I put this CD on, this mindfulness for beginners, and it, it really, there was something, something in it that just changed everything for me. And I did, uh, so there's two, two CDs with this mindfulness for beginners. The, the first CD is uh, John Kabat-Zinn talking about mindfulness and its benefits. And the second CD is actually, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a range of different meditations. And I remember doing my first mindfulness meditation. It's just a 10 minute meditation. And I'll never forget, I went to, I just went to wash my hands afterwards. And I, I put the tap on and I, I, I was washing my hands and there was, 
peace of mind. There was silence and, you know, all I heard was the water running and the birds were singing outside. And I was just like, I have peace of mind. I have some peace of mind. And that was just extraordinary. That was an extraordinary experience. And I was like, I can, I can somehow find some peace of mind. So that was something that, for me, I know mindfulness maybe doesn't, it's not for everyone, but for me, I think that made a huge, huge difference, yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and having that courage. Um, my question is to Johnny, you <laughs> again. Um, and I was wondering, how did you overcome um, the urge of self-punishment and feeling that you were burdening those around you? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 I still, <laughs> it's an ongoing thing, to be honest. It's ongoing. It, it, yeah, it's ongoing. Um, I think, for me, learning about self-compassion, I mean, when I read this book, this, the Kristen Neff, uh, her book on self-compassion, kind of scared me. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm so, so hard on myself. I'm so I'm brutal. I was brutal with myself. Um, it was, you know, awful. And um, so learning about self-compassion... And, and, and starting this compassion-focused therapy, it's, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to have a, a therapist in London. He's called, he's called Charlie Harriet Maitland, and um, I don't know, he might be worth having a look online. He's done some amazing videos on, on, on compassion for people that hear voices. Amazing, amazing guy. And um, anyway, starting the, the CFT, the compassion-focused therapy, that's really helped to, um, yeah, to stop beating myself up. I mean, that's... As I say, it's a, it's, a, it's a long... I've done two years now of therapy, and it's ongoing, and it's a lot of work, but um, that's been a massive help. That's been a massive help, the, the compassion, the compassion. We don't talk enough about compassion, self-compassion, I think. Uh, my, my therapist is called um, uh, Charlie, Charlie Herriot, H-E-R-I-O-T, uh, Maitland, M-A-I-T-L-A-N-D. He, he works very closely with uh, Eleanor Longdon, and I'm sure some of you might be familiar with Eleanor Longdon and her... Amazing TED talk about you know the voice the voices in her head. She did the TED talk. He, he works together with her. So I'm afraid there's another group who are trying to come in. So I just want to say thank you again. This was absolutely fabulous. 